Hi everybody, I'm Razvi. Welcome back again to Binary Exploitation series, where we are solving the binary exploitation room from TryHackMe. In this video, we will solve the second binary that, as you can see, provides us with nothing else than the binary itself for us to exploit. I have already downloaded the binary, and before proceeding, as always, let us give it execution permissions. And let's execute it to see what it does. I need bad food to feel dead. Am I right? I'm feeling dead because you said I need bad food. Before stepping into its assembly code, let us check what kind of file it is. We can see, just like in the previous video, it is a 64-bit executable, dynamically linked, and it isn't stripped. Okay, very well. You could, uh, for example, try several inputs to see if it is vulnerable to something else. But as I already mentioned in previous videos, we will go straight to the point. So once again, let us disassemble it. And while cutter is loading, don't forget to check for its protections. Let me see. I'm already creating our exploit file and we can see that it is full relocation read only. There are no canaries present on the stack nxbit not executable, bit is enabled, pi is enabled, and nothing else for us to consider for now. So that basically means that we can overflow the buffers in a stack, but we cannot execute code or shellcode from the stack or heap. And pi, of course, pi or pic, implies that the addresses of the text segment, which is where the code instructions are, will change between executions. Now that the binary has loaded, Cutter has finished loading it, let us check right from the beginning, from the main function. As always, it calls setup, it calls banner to print whatever information, and we can see it moves the value bad food in hexadecimal, which by the way, we can read it of course as decimal, but we don't really care whether it is decimal or hexadecimal, they are equivalent and it moves these values into the variable for h, which leaves at rbp minus four and eight h, which leaves at rbp minus eight. And we can see it is considering, it is reading, operating with this data as a double word, which is of course four bytes. We can see it then moves them to specific registers in order to call print f, of course, these values are printed in with this format specifiers as hexadecimal when the format string uh, is interpreted by the printf function. We will talk about format specifiers and format strings in future videos when we uh, deal with format string vulnerability. Then we can see it performs a, a call to scan f, which is a function that reads input from the start input, which is our terminal, and stores it in the var 70 variable, which is rbp minus 70 in hexadecimal, and it reads the data as this format right here. In order for us to check what this address resolves to, we can copy the address and inspect it in hex dump. That's not the address I want. It is this one, in fact. Okay, much better. We can go to that specific address, which is right here, and apparently I cannot zoom it in. Anyways, we can see it corresponds to the format specifier of a string. Scanf, it's reading our input as string. It's treating it as a string. While it's true that the string specifier is irrelevant for this particular example, this binary we are about to exploit, it is nonetheless very important to know what is actually happening with Scanf. Since it is reading our input as a string, that means that scanf will stop reading our input when it encounters, when it detects a null byte. Because in C-like languages, strings are null terminated. That is, if scanf is interpreting our data as string, which it is, and it finds a null byte at a given position, whatever follows that null byte will be discarded. This is irrelevant because we won't be working with null bytes, but it could be the case. There are some times when you have to consider what bad chars are for a given uh, vulnerable function. Now, moving back to our code, we have to also consider that scanf is one of those functions that you should never use. There are safer alternatives like 
uh, f gets or ss can f underscore s for example why because can f just like get is one of those functions that doesn't put any bound to the input to its length it performs no bound checking that is you can write how much data you want as long as of course you don't input one of those special characters that prevent scanf from reading anymore which in our case is a null byte for example even though the allocated space goes from or ranges from rbp-70 to rbp-8 in hexadecimal we can write way more in fact we can write until we break the program we have one code block which is very important for us which is this one right here because it calls system executing the bin sh command that is the code that we want to actually execute we want to reach this instruction right here this call to system in order to do so we can trace back what is actually happening and we can see we have to follow the false branch of this conditional jump and in order to execute this code portion right here we have to follow the false branch of this conditional jump right here at address 960 and what are these conditional jumps the first of them we can see it's comparing uh, the value of our 4h variable with coffee and if the values aren't equal it will comply with the conditional jump it will follow the true branch in other words we want this conditional jump to not be true for it to not be true is the same as talking about jump if equal because we want this condition to not apply in other words if the value of this variable right here equals to coffee it will follow this false branch of the conditional jump and in this portion of the code it happens just the same if this conditional jump happens to be true it will follow the true branch which will call exit and we want to avoid that because our program will obviously exit so we want to follow the false branch that is the conditional jump to be false in other words what is relevant for us is that if the value of the 8h variable equals to code it will follow the false branch of this conditional jump and finally calling system now how can we manage to change the value of both var 4h and var 8h when we previously discussed that they are being assigned a specific value which is bad food and feel dead at the very beginning well as i've just mentioned scanf allows us to write as much data as we want and we will start writing or rather said our input is being saved from rbp-70 and as you may already know writing into memory happens from lower addresses towards higher ones the variables that we must overwrite happens to be on higher addresses than the starting address of our buffer in other words we must write several bytes of padding from rbp-70 until we reach rbp-8 and then in rbp-8 we should write four bytes and just the same for rbp-4 now please bear in mind that even though we see here only three bytes or two bytes in this case the comparison is being made by considering full four bytes values see now this is a double word comparison and how can it be that it is comparing four bytes from this address with only two bytes in this number we have here well because this is the interpretation that the disassembler or the debugger is performing for us as uh, mere mortal humans to better understand this code but in fact in memory the comparison between numbers always happens with the same number of bytes you have to take into account that this value right here is the same as let us say hexadecimal 0000cod3 these values are exactly the same and this is what is happening in memory the computer the cpu is comparing this number right here with whatever it's contained in this address now that we better understand what this binary is doing there is only one thing left for us to think about and that is how many bytes do we want to pad before actually overwriting these variables right here well the math we have to perform is actually very simple we can use whatever calculator we like of your choice of course 
In hexadecimal, for example, we know we start writing at RBP minus 70 and we have to write up to RBP minus 8. That is in hexadecimal 70 minus 8, which equals to 68 in hexadecimal or 104 in decimal. And these numbers, we should note them in our exploit so we can later check them. Now the next thing to note is what are the expected values. It is coffee in var 4h and code in var 8h. And after taking these notes, we can start writing our exploit. As always, I am going to use Poon tools. I will define our context and let us define our payload. We know that we need padding, which I'm going to use with the A character, and we need 68 in hexadecimal padding bytes. And then we want var 8h, which is closer to RBP-70. With this padding, we will write from RBP-70 until we reach RBP-8. And after writing it, we have to write the four bytes corresponding to var 8h, which is this value right here. Since we are working on a little endian machine, we have to convert this number to little endian and we have to represent it in the form of four bytes. Puntool's library already provides us with the needed functions to convert the numbers to little endian and in four bytes format. In this case, we have to use P32 that stands for pack 32 bits. And then after var 8, we have var 4 which must be equal to this value right here. Just to state things clear and make sure that we all understand what's happening, when we use a function like pack for 32 bits and provide it with a value like this one, what's happening is that this number gets converted to little endian and in four bytes format. This is the return value of calling this function. As you can see, we are concatenating with bytes. That means that this function is of course returning bytes. If you do not understand what byte ordering is, what endian is, is, little endian, big endian, and how this number right here is represented in this way into memory, I recommend you watching the video where I explained in detail what endian is, is and why this is a very important topic, especially for binary exploitation. You must make sure that you really understand how numbers and data is represented into memory and what endian is. is. Now, as always, we have to define our process, which is assigned to the p variable, we have to receive some data even though it isn't really necessary, then we will send line with our payload of course, and finally we want an interactive session so we can make use of the shell. Without further delay, let's see if this actually works. I will launch it as always with Python 3, we get printed the message, yes I need coffee to code, and we can see that we got our shell in the local machine. Now the next thing is of course exploiting it in the victim machine, exploiting it remotely rather than locally. By the way, just a quick comment while the TryHackMe machine is deploying, I leave a link to the video explaining Endianis in the description of this one, so you can check it out whenever you want. Okay, the virtual machine is already deployed, I am connected to TryHackMe's VPN, our binary is running in port 9002 and I checked that I got connection to the remote machine. So let us change our exploit because we don't want to launch a local process. We want it to be accessed remotely somewhere like this IP address and port 9001 and two, sorry. And now let us launch the exploit. I need bad food, am I right? Yes, I need coffee to code. We can see we got our shell in the remote machine. Now we can read our flag and check if it is correct. Which apparently is. And that was the second binary from the binary exploitation room. We have seen how we can overflow a buffer due to the scanf function being used to retrieve user input and we have seen how to modify values of given variables. It's important for us to understand what endianness is and how to represent numbers in memory. I hope you liked the video and you found it useful. If there's something you want to say, leave a comment below. And see you in the next one. Until then, GG.